Welcome everyone to, to the uh, webinar, uh, co-sponsored by the um, UBC uh, Emeritus College and the European Association for Professors Emeriti. I'm very pleased to welcome you to this webinar on healthy aging because it is an initiative that is intended to celebrate two very special occasions, not only for Emeriti, of course, but for uh, really worldwide. And that is the World Day of Older Persons, October 1st, plus the first decade of the U new, new UN decade of on healthy aging. We'll hear words of welcome uh, from uh, the president of the university, Professor uh, Santa Ono, and that will be followed by words from the principal of the Emeritus College at UBC, Professor Emeritus Joost Blum of the Faculty of Law. Thank you. Professor Ono. Thank you, Diane. And hello, everyone. It's an honor to speak to you today. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. I would also like to acknowledge that you are joining us today from many places, near and far, and acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands. Healthy aging is of increasing importance worldwide. One billion people are 60 years or older and most of them live in middle to low income countries. And the number of elderly is growing in both absolute and relative terms. As people get older, it's important that they are able to live healthy, fulfilling lives. University-based research and innovation, including that done by UBC's new Interdisciplinary Center for Healthy Aging, are playing an important role as we adjust to this new reality. Events such as this one are also important, and I would like to congratulate the UBC Emeritus College and the European Association of Professors Emeriti for taking the initiative to hold today's panel. Best wishes for a productive event. Professor Bloom. Good morning, everyone. Um, on behalf of the uh, University of British Columbia Emeritus College, it's my great pleasure to welcome all participants to this webinar on healthy aging, which uh, we in the Emeritus College are presenting jointly with the European Association of Professors Emeriti. We're delighted to be able to contribute to this event associations of retired faculty members are uniquely placed not only to lead discussion of healthy aging, uh, of which today is an example, but also to put into practice new ways to foster healthy aging. President Ono, from whom we just heard, strongly supported our transition uh, in 2018 from an association of professors emeriti which had been active for decades to the ubc emeritus college this change has been very important for us both symbolically and practically by giving retired faculty for the first time a formal place within the university structure the change symbolized the idea that upon retirement, a faculty member does not depart from academic life, but continues that life in a new phase. At the same time, emphasizing that each retired faculty member continues as a member of the university community within the Emeritus College has extensive practical consequences. For one thing, it provides an institutional avenue for the university to support scholarly activity by emeriti, by extending to them, although in modified form, of course, incentives and support mechanisms available to current faculty. 
Retired faculty are no longer required to be productive since we're off the payroll, but we are encouraged to be as academically active as we choose. Continuing to do work that you love with the freedom to do it as much or as little as you want is a prime enabler, I would think, of healthy aging. Another practical effect of being Emeritus College members is that our retired faculty are in some ways more fully engaged with the university as a whole than they were even while they were employed. While working full time, we typically, at least at our university, have little time or reason to venture beyond our disciplinary department. And now we can regularly meet and learn from colleagues from every discipline. And these extended social and intellectual horizons are another key to healthy aging. In today's webinar, we have the chance to engage more fully with the theory and the practice of healthy aging. Again, a very warm welcome to everybody participating today. And now I'll turn things back to Diane Newell. Thank you very much, Joost. And uh, pre also President Ono, of course. Um, I'll just quickly introduce myself. I am a Professor Emerita with the Department of History and in the Institute for the Oceans and Fisheries, uh, where I am uh, currently interim director of the Center for Indigenous Fisheries. Uh, I also formally connected with the European Association of Professors Emerita, which is a great pleasure. The uh, program that follows will be in the hands of the two moderators that we have. It will consist of altogether six distinguished Emeriti professors, four of the panelists and two are the moderators. The, um, the first section will be presentations by the panelists uh, and then a section on uh, sort of um, uh, questions and, and engagement between the uh, um, moderators and the panelists. And within the group of panelists. At the last section, we'll be open to uh, members of the audience who can begin uh, recording questions uh, down in the, looks like the bottom uh, right-hand corner of the screen, of the webinar screen um, in the qu question and answer Q&A button. And if you want to direct a question to a particular person, please indicate that in your question. So I'll turn things over to um, our two moderators who are professors Emeriti Luigi Campanella from the, uh, who is general secretary of the uh, European Association of Professors Emeriti and Anne Juncker, who is vice principal of the um, UBC Emeritus College. Luigi, would you begin please? Thank you. Very good. Thank you. It's a pleasure for me to be with you and uh, in this very important uh, concession. And uh, I am sure that uh, even if I speak uh, from uh, uh, Italy, where now is almost night, uh, you can uh, have a good morning. So, as you know, in the program, uh, I have to present uh, two speakers. The first uh, one uh, is uh, Professor Les Hebdon. He's a very well-known, uh, eminent uh, uh, professor of university and he is uh, very well-known also in the field of culture. Uh, his uh, Cebu is uh, very, very rich. So I just say something. He was uh, vice chancellor of the University of Eton and then he is Vice Chancellor of University of Bedford, and is also director of the Fun Access to Higher Education in that university. His uh, inter scientific interests are related to the analytical chemistry applied to environmental problems, and particularly to the studies of the trace elements in the nature, and so their interaction with the ecosystem. He was member of many boards, 
And I want to recall you the most important, according to me, that is uh, the member of the certification working group of uh, uh, 12th uh, general direction of the uh, European Union. And uh, also it was in, nine, in 2018, uh, recognized as one of the most influential 500 people in England. Uh, he was also in that year uh, knighted by Her Majesty the Queen for his uh, engagement, for his activity in the field of education and of um, social mobility. So I think uh, uh, we have only to, to learn uh, from him. So please, Les, uh, the word to you. Thank you very much indeed, um, uh, Luigi. Um, I think uh, you've just proved that there are less than 500 people with any influence in this country, but um, it's good to be uh, with you uh, this afternoon. Um, you're never too old to uh, learn. Uh, that's uh, a truism, and uh, that's why uh, if we have the title slide of, of, of my talk, um, uh, uh, I have chosen uh, 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 lifelong learning and healthy aging. Uh, but uh, uh, lifelong learning is... Uh, the concept of uh, pursuing education throughout life. Uh, the strategy is to create opportunity to learn uh, throughout the, the lifespan. Uh, but why should you engage in lifelong learning? Many individuals stop uh, additional education and skills development beyond formal or compulsory education. Lifelong learning is usually self-motivated, often informal, usually voluntary and part-time, and frequently based on personal interests. The advantages of uh, lifelong learning are shown on the next slide. Uh, <clears throat> they're often cited as, uh, as the first one is job success. Uh, the uh, acquisition of entry-level skills to go into particular careers or perhaps more frequently, upskilling uh, for promotion and advancement in career. Indeed, a survey of uh, part-time education in the United Kingdom showed that the majority of such learners were taking classes in order to change their employment. Perhaps more important for us this afternoon is the issue of brain health. Research shows that we need to keep our brain cells working at optimum levels in order to limit cognitive and memory decline. <laughs> Neurobiologists at the University of California, Irvine, have shown visual evidence that learning promotes brain health. Everyday forms of learning animate neuron receptors that help keep brain cells functioning at optimum levels. Uh, you can read the research in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Rhythms are promoted, which are vital uh, to the encoding of memories. These so-called theta rhythms uh, weaken as we age, and this can result in memory impairment. Staying mentally active can keep neuronal signaling at a constant rate, which may limit memory and cognitive decline. So we're beginning to understand what we've always known. Those who stay active learners into the third age see benefits in memory and reasoning. And the third reason is to stay connected. Adult education is one of the best ways to meet new people and to connect with new ideas, suggesting it is one of the best ways to meet new friends and to stay in touch with our ever-changing world. To be fulfilled. Marjan Lal, in a, a review in Social and Behavioral Sciences, suggests that the greatest benefit of lifelong learning is an enriched and a fulfilled life. Our lives are enriched by lifelong learning, but we're also enabled to contribute 
to making the world a better place through enlightened social change uh, and applied science. Finally, all of these things help our emotional balance and contribute to our mental well-being, or in old-fashioned terms, our happiness. The new uh, Economics uh, Foundation found five ways to mental well-being. Connect, be active, take notice, keep learning, and give. Lifelong learning meets at least four of these as we seek to guide those who are aging away from depression, loneliness, and that other pandemic, the one of mental illness. So why do I think that lifelong learning is under threat when it is so obviously an important part of healthy aging? I think it's because of the increased emphasis upon a functional approach to education. If you search lifelong learning as I have, Google will shower you with uh, items about uh, upskilling for particular jobs. Now, the need to reskill people in work is a major challenge for governments. And uh, to fund it, resources for lifelong learning are increasingly directed towards getting an economic return. The next slide, please. In some ways, it should be easier uh, than ever to engage in lifelong learning. Most countries have distance learning universities, for example, in my own country, the Open University. And uh, the rapid rise of massive open online courses or MOOCs gives another avenue. These should be open and accessible to all. Organizations such as the Workers' Educational Association, which has been promoting adult education since 1903, increasingly find that they're providing opportunities for older learners through online lectures. The University of the Third Age is a global movement started in France to promote extramural activity of universities to those who've had the opportunity to undertake learning for its own sake. Two different models have emerged. Most European countries have followed the French model, but in English speaking countries, they followed a geragogic model. That is where the emphasis is on sharing knowledge rather than formal education. Some countries use the term lifelong learning institutes rather than the university of the third age. Uh, and I want to strongly advocate this sharing model as a way in which emeritus professors uh, can uh, stay active uh, both as learners and as teachers. In fact, it reminds me of a story told by uh, the late Nobel Prize winner, Max Perutz. Uh, Max is a so-called enemy alien uh, at uh, the start of the Second World War was sent to, to Newfoundland. He was interned with many other academics and they formed their own university, as it were. They taught each other their own specialist subjects. And Max spoke about how important that was in his development as an academic. I thought that was a rather nice story that uh, links lifelong learning, Canada and Europe, and the benefits of lifelong learning on which to end this short talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Les, for, for your presentation. As always, you are very, very clear and uh, especially stimulating. So I have also some question to, to put to you and after I will do. So I pass to the second speaker of uh, this session. Uh, this is uh, our 
joking uh, uh, Erich, joking that the friends call Joe, and so I want to call him Joe. And so Joe uh, is a very well-known uh, pediatrician and nephrologist uh, when he started uh, in the kidney physiology, but then passed uh, to, uh, to nef nephrology in uh, the tropics, uh, probably connected uh, to his activity in that area, in that geographical area. Uh, and focused on diagnostic laboratory methods in nephrology. As you know, the experimental activity in the, came, in the case of medicine is a very, very important one because sometimes uh, between the medicine and other disciplines, there are a gap expressly in the field of experimental activity. So he's, uh, he's ending his career in studying the diversities of a child healthcare services in Europe and treated more than 1,400 children in Hanover and Berlin before and after a kidney and liver transplantation, other very, very important field. So please, Joe, the word to you. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, my motto is that the opposite of old is not young. The opposite of old is new. As long as people are open to experiencing the new, people will successfully manage all stages of their life, including young and old age. In the context of healthy aging, the antonyms young and old are related to each other and refer to a common basis. Aristotle concluded that virtues are located between two opposite extremes. So what are my ways of analyzing long-term effects of early life experiences on healthy aging? I think that cellular senescence is involved both during growth and development of children and during aging at all later stages of life. Aging is characterized by complex biological and psychosocial mechanisms, which should therefore be studied by holistic complex systems thinking in medicine and in philosophy. Complexity of aging is not only related to old people with medical complexity of diseases, Therefore, I will not focus on medical services. I believe that prevention of premature aging and preparing for normal, successful and healthy aging must start in early childhood. The influences and the influencers are diverse and multifactorial. Thirdly, I believe that grandparents and other old people play a key role in preparing children for healthy aging. My messages are related to the French philosopher Edgar Morin, who wrote, at the time of globalization, specialization drives the progress of knowledge. However, it also drives to breaking down knowledge, which should be kept as a whole. The disjunction between disciplines and also in healthcare services hides the connections and the complexity of the whole human being. It is a paradox that medical progress induces regression of knowledge and causes new ignorance. How might complex systems thinking help healthcare providers avoid reductive thinking to improve a combination of deductive and inductive thinking in theory and in practice with regard to healthy aging? Edgar Morin concluded that in general, we are in extreme need of transdisciplinary concepts to extract, to assimilate and integrate knowledge, which is broken down, separated, compartmentalized and fragmented. I conclude that successful normal aging is a lifetime project. I realized during my active clinical years that healthy and unhealthy aging are parts of a holistic life project that requires the intersection of different health projects. In my opinion, health depends about 80 to 
on general health care and only 10 to 20 percent on medical care. So what is the role of healthcare systems in the context of healthy aging? After studying child healthcare service in Europe for 20 years, I came to the conclusion that there is a general dilemma of healthcare services. In spite of undoubted great progress in medical care, there is also an increasing distrust of Europeans in general healthcare services. This success mistrust paradox was leading to insecurity and non-compliance to treatment contracts of patients and to non-adherence to therapeutic guidelines of their caregivers. I believe that dynamic thinking in public health care is often primarily directed to the adult world. The health status of employed state-preserving adults is seen as the main aim when supporting the developmental stages from fetus, newborn, infant, toddler, school child to adolescence and adulthood. I therefore conclude that everything that healthcare systems produce should ultimately serve the holistic whole. This means that healthy aging must be brought about early in the entire population to prevent premature aging. Giving general priority to the adult world of working adults is counterproductive if children and old people benefit only indirectly from the process of fragmented thinking. It is the life cycle model which must include pediatrics and geriatrics because it would not work without investments in children's and old people's health. The concept of root, cause, effect and long-term consequences should have priority during all discussions on healthy aging. Investing into child health has the advantage that every euro successfully invested in childhood pays out in old age. The holistic approach in healthcare systems embraces the patient's perspective of adequacy, accessibility, affordability, availability, equity, efficacy, efficiency, and equality. When new strategies are developed in healthcare crises, the thinking of those who are responsible opinion makers must take the holistic whole into account and be deductively related to the problematic individual parts. This is part of a top-down thinking and acting, asking those health providers who are working at the front. Conversely, bottom-up strategies must originate from the lower levels of the providers with the result of presenting practical solutions to politicians. Subsidiary influences must be respected and valued through inductive thinking. The last steps in this procedure aim at reaching a consensus of all levels of caregivers. Competition of priorities should, be, should avoid clientelism in harming of the holistic whole. I have learned from the COVID-19 crisis that European countries failed to achieve their ambitious aims because of a lack of complex system thinking. Individualization of care for all people is patients-centered and based on their participation during opinion and decision-making. Personalization of care is also patient-centered, but it is developed and co coordinated by experts. Differentiation of care is expert-centered. And last but not least, collectivization of care for old olds is society-oriented and a matter of public health systems. The competition of these four different interests requires clear management structures communication, cooperation, and willingness to agree on a consensus. I hope that I'm not a dreamer. Gerald Starr concluded that studies of aging have come to be increasingly multidisciplinary and to encompass a whole life course from young to old age, including the professional and cultural context of aging and biographical changes in life courses. This is where childhood comes in. Why may grandparents 
play a key role in preparing children for healthy aging. Most kids experience fearful thoughts about death at some stage of their early lives. However, studies elicitating the views of children on aging are rare. There is a need for more studies that focus on children imagining their own future as an old person. To address this gap, more than 2,000 children participated in an online survey, which included questions on aging. Katrina Lloyd's findings suggest that children who hold negative views about old people visualized poorer outcomes for themselves at the age of 70. In conclusion, aging is related with diseases and old age is indeed the most frequent route of death. However, this does not mean that it is only a burden or a disease. Old age has a great value in itself. I conclude that healthy aging should not mean staying young forever. I, in the context of healthy aging, the implications of complex systems thinking and the need to develop child-friendly strategies for healthy aging must be discussed more often in politics. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And, and sir, sir. I am Anne Jump, Jump. Vice Principal of the Emeritus College. College. It's with great pleasure that I introduce Dr. Judith Hall, who has been a colleague, friend, and mentor of mine for over 40 years. Judy is Professor Emeritus in the Department of Pediatrics, Faculty of Medicine at the University of British Columbia. She is internationally renowned as a pediatrician and ge clinical geneticist. Among her publications are summary reviews and articles that are considered classics, having introduced aspects of the new genetics. She has contributed in many leadership roles, including presidency of the American Society of Human Genetics and the American Pediatric Society, where she reshaped priorities and commitments. She has served on numerous national and international committees and boards and continues to do so, most recently agreeing to serve on the European Association for Professors Emeriti Bulletin Review Board. Judy has received many honors for her scientific contributions and lifetime achievements, notable being entry into the Canadian Medical Hall of Fame, Fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, and an Officer of the Order of Canada. Today, Judy is going to speak on her research into healthy aging of professors emeriti. Do emeriti have the opportunity for a new stage of their academic career? Judy. Thank you, Anne. It's a very great pleasure to be asked to speak about something that I'm really interested in. We emeriti represent an enormous human capital and it shouldn't be wasted. When I was born, my life expectancy was 59 years. Now, because I'm a woman on the west coast of Canada, it's 89 years, an extra 30 years. The pandemic has emphasized that clean water and immunizations have changed the course of human life expectancy. Some people have always lived into old age. However, depending on how the pandemic plays out, ours will be the first generation that actually has that extra years to find out what we can do with it. Because our generation has been the throwaway, glorified youth generation, ageism has developed and implied that older people are degenerating, lose their abilities, fail to contribute, Although mandatory retirement has been stopped in many jurisdictions, there is still a push for us to retire at a younger age, perhaps even earlier, to make room for new blood and new ideas. And that older folks should just enjoy life and fulfill their bucket list. It is true that senior academics should get to do whatever they wish for health health allowing. And I, you will hear from the next speaker that the average people become happier with age. 
Furthermore, data shows that older workers are more reliable, see the big picture, are better at finding solutions in the workplace, mentor the younger workers, and work in a collaborative spirit. Our challenge as academics is to figure out what the next stage for us is. What are the models? What are the possibilities? It's quite clear that after the age of 65, we should give up control. But what are the new types of contributions? Every indigenous society has a council of wise elders who don't have to be responsible. However, because over the years they've gained a variety of experience and have developed experience, perspective, knowledge, and wisdom. If you have been through conflict, drought, disaster, you know where to find water, small game, and hide. The elders had been through all kinds of environmental changes, from famine and earthquake to typhoons. And if there'd been a war with another tribe, they knew their tricks. It would no longer be their jo job to lead, but rather to be aware of the past history and support the young generations. Our question is how that works within the academic setting. What is the role for the senior academician? I've had the pleasure of serving on a committee to give advice about UBC's campus physical structure. Campus planning, of course, has, is responsible for actually making things happen. But we've, we make suggestions about how to make the campus a friendlier, more functional, more workable position because of our experience and love for the campus. I must say, we have had made many suggestions that have been taken up, and of course, a few that aren't. But the campus is more beautiful and more functional because of our committee. It's a wonderful model for how to use the, our experience without adding a burden of responsibility. Another question, of course, is for the Emeritus Associations in college, is how do we both help individuals as they come of age and help the university as it's dealing with new kinds of situ situations. As senior academics, we need to build new models, provide advice to our colleagues who are coming of age and living longer. We need to help them find a purpose. On several occasions, I've tried to assess and tabulate the kinds of things that Emeriti do. And it's become clear to me that a third of Emeriti retire to their family and their community, become engaged, volunteering, and providing care. And making this contribution, they have an enormous role to play. In fact, it turns out that the average senior gives 30 hours of volunteer work each week. The second third continue with their scholarly activities, teaching, mentoring, finishing research projects, and beginning new projects, often interdisciplinary, that wouldn't have been possible in their previous career. The last third are particularly interesting to me because they use their experience and their well honed skills and apply them in different ways. Teaching in a third world country, becoming the executive officer for their professional group, being a consultant, writing, creative writing, civic engagement, and so forth. So what are these new roles and what are the possibility of there being models for the new retiring Emeriti? We represent a very special human capital that shouldn't be wasted. We are privileged in so many ways. And mostly, Emeriti have a quite reasonable and secure retirement. In preparation for retirement, one begins to need to plan at least five years ahead, not only for financial reasons, but to do, develop a perspective of all the possible ways to use our experience. Activities will keep evolving over time. There's no right or wrong or single answer. Nevertheless, 
some thought needs to be given in ways to develop and maintain physical healthy and well-being, family relations, what one's leisure and social activities will be, what continuing personal development you'd like to undertake, what will be your relationship to your past work and your career, and of course, financial situations as, as well as housing. Circumstances will change over time, but planning is essential for a peaceful transition and finding the new purpose in your life. So what are the roles and new roles for emeritus associations? Initially, the most important and usually the first role that emeritus associations take on is social in the broadest sense of the word, getting together programs, special interest groups, a range of social activities that allow continuing social interconnection with colleagues, the same generation. Continuing social interaction has been shown over and over again, be a sign of successful aging. The pandemic has shown us this can actually be done virtually. As Meredith groups mature, they are often looking for ways to increase the benefits to their members and to increase their relationship with the university. Usually, newsletters are developed. Other kinds of activities, such as lecture series on research done since retirement, studies of a political or a social problem, activities and programs engaging trainees and graduate students, and the support of the development projects for the university money raising. Most emeritus groups develop some kind of program to help thinking about the retirement of future retirees. As I close, I want to reflect that genetic, molecular, and IT advances begun to reveal that there are different physiologies at different ages and stages, which reflect evolutionarily the tasks of that particular stage. This all takes the form of alternative biochemical pathways, alternative splicing, and new connections within the brain. And these also give the possibility of age-related vulnerabilities of this new stage. Soon, there will need to be a tissue-specific, time and development-specific, sex-specific, functional genome-produced so that we can understand how the human body works and have major opportunities for new kinds of therapy. I've become aware through surveying that many new skills develop after the age of 65. Again, what is the role of emeritus associations in this venture? Of course, it is to be volunteers, both to be studied and provide samples and collaborate. Last but not least, I want to remind all emeriti that they are the keepers of the family history, that they have the opportunity to describe what's happened over their lifetime as a gift to their grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and for, so forth. Thank you very much. Thank you, Judy. I am now pleased to introduce Dr. John Helliwell, who is a senior fellow of the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research, or CIFAR, and co-director of CIFAR's program on social interactions, identity, and well-being. John is also Professor Emeritus of Economics at the University of British Columbia, a member of the National Statistics Council, a research associate of the National Bureau of Economic Research, and a co-editor of the World Happiness Report. He was previously visiting special advisor at the Bank of Canada, several Canadian Royal Commissions, the OECD, and central banks in Australia and New Zealand. He has been a visiting fellow, uh, research fellow at Merton College, Oxford, Sir St. Catherine's College, Oxford, and the Mackenzie King Visiting Professor of Canadian Studies at Harvard. John is recognized internationally as a pioneer in broadening the use of subjective well being to measure and improve quality of life and in establishing the social sources of well being. 
His contributions have been recognized by appointments as a Royal, as a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada and an officer of the Order of Canada. He is going to speak today about key supports for happy, healthy aging. Dr. Hallowell. It's a great pleasure to be with you today. Uh, uh, as Santa Ono reminded us, uh, speaking from the uh, Musqueam lands where many of the realities I'm going to be exposing to you have been known to them for many centuries. Happy aging and healthy aging are the same thing. It's a complicated linkage. Uh, as you might guess from what some of the previous speakers have uh, complained about, uh, which is essentially the excessive compartmentalization of science and of knowledge, uh, we have not brought these aspects of life together in the way they should. So that in the study of healthy aging, some of the first uh, attempts to bring happiness into the equation were to say, do happier people live healthier lives? And uh, there's some very nice work done uh, in Canada by epidemiologists at the University of Toronto, where essentially they looked at a huge survey of uh, people's estimates of the quality of their lives, uh, life satisfaction, and then picked out many thousands of these and then followed their subsequent medical histories through their own medical records coming from the uh, provincial medical systems in Ontario. And they discovered that people who rated themselves satisfied with their lives compared to unsatisfied with their lives, after adjusting for all their previous medical conditions and history and all the known factors that uh, produce morbidity and mortality at any given age, they find that the uh, odds of uh, mortality were increased by 60% for the unhappy relative to the unhappy, for the unhappy relative to the happy, and the odds of morbidity even more, 70%. And that's then used as an argument that people should be happy because they then will be healthier. Uh, I object to that for the same reason that Joe gave earlier. That is an instrumental uh, way of looking at it. Uh, the right way of looking at it is that the objective of healthcare and all other aspects of our abilities to look after each other uh, should be based on happiness. Uh, so we're not after just keeping people alive, we're after the quality of their lives. So we're not supposed to be maximizing uh, length of life, we're maximizing quality of life. And so this has involved thinking about the whole link between aging and health quite differently. And so within medicine now, there is an attempt right from the top in the WHO to general practice. Uh, and uh, as uh, uh, Joe mentioned, even right in, uh, in, in, in the pediatric care, uh, to start focusing on what our objectives are. And that involves you then moving uh, from uh, instrumental definitions of success to holistic measures of success. And uh, in the case of happiness, uh, in an Aristotelian way, we advocate simply asking people about the quality of their life as a whole. And then from the scientific perspective, we go out and look at the as various aspects of their lives and infer what it is that produces uh, happier lives. How has all this been possible and what is required to do it? Well, first you require huge amounts of data. So we work with an statistical agencies internationally and nationally to do it. Second, you need a broad public interest and support for this more holistic view of life. Uh, and then you need to develop the underlying science and then eventually feed it back into departmental and, uh, and uh, government-wide policies. A key feature of that uh, was the uh, resolution 10 years ago before the United Nations from the Prime Minister of Bhutan, J.Y. Thinley, uh, advocating that nations should make a subjective well-being 
uh, a key focus of their national attentions. And in the preparations for a subsequent high level meeting at the UN almost 10 years ago now, uh, we prepared the first World Happiness Report, which is essentially intended to provide a more holistic view of national success. And so it's not about the amount that nations produce or consume or the number of people who are employed or the length of their lives. In some sense, it's about all of those. It's about looking at the quality of lives as people evaluate it themselves. Uh, that was seen broadly enough as important antidote to the information people normally get about the quality of life, that that has led to what are now annual World Happiness Reports with the 10th anniversary uh, coming up uh, in, uh, next March on World Happiness Day. I'm delighted for the chance to link the, that body of research uh, to its applications in old age. Let me pick up on an earlier uh, uh, point made by uh, Joe that we don't want to think of, and, and, and Judy made a very similar point, we don't want to think of the old and the young as being separate. We want to think of them as being linked in holistic ways. Let me give you a specific example that we have been studying uh, in Canada. It's a, a program when you could imagine why once we thought we knew what produced happy lives, where we think we'd see people who were delivering them, and it's a program called iGen in Saskatoon that takes a grade six class and has it operate for the entire year uh, in an elder care facility. So this is actually doing in a very unusual way, uh, the kind of linking between generations that produce wisdom for the young and happiness and connections uh, for the elders. And so even in COVID, we have been zooming in on these interactions uh, in that institution. And it's uh, quite heartwarming. So we knew a lot of these results from more experimental uh, narrow stuff, but we got to see it in the faces and the stories of the people themselves, that the children had their life views changed in ways that would enable them to be better adults and happier adults. And the elders, many of them said they were kept alive and happy in a way that was simply otherwise not available to them. So that's an, a practical example of uh, what can be done. The goal, as I've said, is to make happier lives. The goal, uh, the happier lives, uh, the objective. Uh, let me now focus on some of the things we have learned that produce the happier lives. Uh, and uh, also, as we know from the previous a round of epidemiological research, they'll also be healthier lives uh, as, as well. One of the things we learned when we started studying these data from all around the world is that the traditional goals of development, good health and, uh, and incomes uh, were still there, uh, but they then are supplemented by four measures of the social context, which together are much more important. Do you have someone to count on in times of trouble? Do you live uh, in a generous society? Do you have freedom uh, to make uh, your key life decisions? And do you have trust in the environment in which you live? And all of those are extraordinarily important. And all of them have a central core which is the interactions uh, between people, uh, the quality of those interactions. And so we know that's not only the number of friends you have, it's how you interact with them. Uh, everyone these days looks at problems and tries to fix them. The whole point of the underlying medical science, health science that we're learning now is the absence of the negatives. In other words, the absence of disease is not the same as the creation of good health. And so all the way through, we should be thinking of creating positives and not just eliminating negatives. Here's a particular uh, statistical uh, example of that. Uh, that, uh, let me pass over that one because I can see the uh, clock uh, uh, moving moving on me. Uh, 
the, I'd like to show you a picture uh, emphasizing the importance of the social context, uh, which is fundamental. The example I skipped over was showing that wallet returns, feeling like your wallet would be returned if it was found by a stranger or a police officer means more to your underlying evaluation of your life than the absence of mental health problems, absence of fear going out in the streets and absence of being threatened by violent crime. So all those put together. So to believe in a positive supporting environment is much more life enhancing than simply the absence of disease and, and, and dangers. So let me share the screen and show you a picture. Is that coming through okay? Yes, looks good, great. Thanks so much. It's always nice to have confirmation. Uh, so this is using that uh, Canadian Community Health Survey data. And this is comparing people at different ages. So as uh, Judy forecast, it is showing for everybody, and not quite everybody, as you'll see, uh, the uh, unhappiest age is that slough of too much activity and too many pressures in the middle of life. Uh, and then there's a steady rise from age 50 right throughout or older ages. But you'll see it, there's two points being made by this one picture. The first is those who have a strong feeling of belonging to their community compared to those who have a weak sense of belonging to their community. That's always, that's worth on average over the whole life course about half a point on a zero to 10 range for life satisfaction. Well, that's huge. That's about the equivalent of trebling your income for uh, among other things, or the movement from very bad health to very good health. But you see the dynamics here. That effect is very much greater at higher ages than lower ages. Uh, it's, it's half on average. Um, but it's between uh, 0.6 and 0.7 points from 60 uh, up till uh, 70. And over 75, it's more than a full point on this 10 point scale. Well, you could see why that might be because uh, uh, social connections is always important. The social connections you get through your uh, children's schooling and your own employment and so on are dissipated. Uh, and hence the community involvement becomes uh, both an important part of your job later on, but it's obviously important to the success of the lives of those who are involved. I think that's appropriate point for me to end my time and to turn it back for a general discussion. I, I must say that I very much enjoyed the other presentations and look forward to our discussion. Thank you. Can you stop sharing your screen, John? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, John. Was uh, I was always convinced that that happiness uh, is surely a defense against uh, illness and pathologies, and that to be happy uh, can be a useful. Uh, way to fight against illness and sometimes against also aging. So I come back to my speaker, I mean the speakers of my sessions and uh, Les and Joe. And so I have immediately a, a question for both them, one for John Les and one for Joe concerning Les. You have spoken about lifelong learning, but uh, less. What about the lifelong teaching? Because uh, in the case of, uh, of uh, uh, emeriti professors, anyway, retired, that can be useful to the university in the case of uh, uh, luckness of, uh, of people, of teachers. They can, could be useful. So we have also a lifelong teaching. In the sense, um, Luigi, that um, uh, 
to be a good teacher, you have to be a good learner. Um, uh, I think um, uh, that you will get the same benefits um, uh, from lifelong teaching as from uh, uh, as from lifelong learning. Um, uh, uh, that is assuming uh, that uh, that you're refreshing and keeping up to date um, uh, your teaching. Uh, you can see that the benefits of connection would be there. The benefits of fulfillment um, uh, would be there. Uh, so I think you can um, uh, take it for granted that um, there would be um, uh, those uh, those benefits. Uh, yes. And so you you think that uh, in the social activities, uh, a retired and emeritus professor could uh, aid to have a, a lifelong learning from citizens. Well, you know I think one of the uh, uh, interesting debates is um, uh, uh, that we all have as 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 a Marity is to make sure that um, we don't block the opportunities uh, for the next uh, uh, generation. I think that's uh, I, I'm a chemist as as, as you are, and uh, we know it's a rapidly moving um, uh, science, um, and therefore uh, that refreshment and lifeblood is important. Um, one of the things that I, I think uh, is exciting is the opportunity to uh, to learn other things. And that's why I gave the story uh, from uh, Max Perutz. Uh, I thought uh, uh, he made it uh, clear to me uh, uh, in, in that um, talking about that experience, how important and valuable it was um, to be able to extend out of the uh, uh, boundaries which um, uh, we all uh, sit within as, 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 as academics. Uh, um, uh, what is it they say that um, uh, being an academic is about uh, knowing more and more about less and less? Well, when you retire, you have the opportunity to break out of that uh, stranglehold and to know uh, a lot more uh, about um, a, a wider range of things. And you have uh, some information about activities of this kind in the United Kingdom, I mean, out of academics. I mean, uh, uh, lifelong learning in, in the church, in the association, in the whole of the cinema for citizens, not for people who are already in the field of, uh, of teaching or of learning. Uh, there are uh, um, uh, quite a few um, uh, voluntary associations which uh, which do that. Um, uh, I mentioned the University of the Third Age, um, uh, which is a, a global um, uh, force um, uh, for um, uh, providing a, a structure within uh, which people can share knowledge and experience. Um, uh, there are other organizations, there's lots of professional businessmen's uh, uh, clubs um, where I, I've known um, uh, uh, chemists um, uh, who've, uh, who've had the opportunity to, to share their, their scientific uh, knowledge and, and experience um, with, um, uh, with uh, uh, people from other fields of, of, of work. Uh, so I think uh, that there are um, uh, uh, a lot of um, opportunities. Um, uh, we um, we move uh, when we retire uh, frequently out of that um, uh, uh, time poor uh, uh, phase of our life into a time rich phase of our life, and uh, and it's important that, that we exploit that um, if we are to sustain uh, our uh, cognitive uh, uh, abilities uh, and and our. Uh, a memory function. Uh, I think that's 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 uh, very clear from uh, the research. Um, I, I cited a, a particularly graphic piece of research, uh, but I think uh, we've all come across um, a research which um, demonstrates the, the importance of staying intellectually active in retirement. Thank you very much. Before to, to, to pass to Joe, I just I want to describe you and my experience. When I came here in the home where I am here now, uh, but I came here uh, about 45 years ago, uh, nothing was around. And practically people had nothing to, to learn. I mean that if you go to university and you go through the courses, okay. But if you are a normal citizen who have a life with your work and want in the evening, learn something about what happens around you, about science, so about knowledge in general terms, it, it doesn't find anything where it was, what was possible. So, so I organized that at that time with the, the older professor of, of Sapienza where I was working, uh, 
uh, a, a courses for these citizens. It was a great success because many people subscribed this. And I found the interest for science, not from, from what they are already in the world of science, but from outside to science. Mm -hmm. uh, Joe, uh, what you depicted, I, I want to, to, uh, to think that is a sort, uh, is a, a species of a circular economy applied to healthy life. I mean that if you invest in the older person for the health, healthy aging, you know that this investment can ad bring advantages also to the medicine for young, but also that if you invest for medicine for young, the advantage will fall on the older. So there is a circular economy of the, of the healthy uh, uh, life. Uh, is it so? Sorry, Joe, you're Sorry. muted. No, I think it's not true. It's, it's simplifying a complex interaction. Um, uh, uh, the the so what you call circular economy uh, has two words. One is circular. This could mean endless loops. Endless loops do not end in solutions. Uh, they are perpetuating and creating more problems than good. The other thing is economy. When we talk ab about economy uh, in the in the context with healthy and happy aging, then there is again a problem um, because people think that the dominating logic is so important because it's related to consciousness. And they think that non-logical processes in the brain are related to subconsciousness. However, the unconscious mind is the rule and not the exception. So I would like to combine the roles of conscious learning that Les was speaking about with the unconscious feelings that John was, um, was talking about by introducing the term combinatory complexity. This is what we need. It's, we don't want to, uh, to, to focus only on the economic, uh, economic aspects. It's the individual person. And here we, are, we are, have to try to overcome barriers between conscious and unconscious in the brain by dynamic processes called from vague unconscious to crisp conscious. This means transforming visions and dreams into plans, models, and concepts. That is what we must try to find out. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Uh, I, I don't see any questions uh, from, the, uh, from people. So I, I try to make another, ones, uh, another one to, to less concerning uh, the, I mean, the, uh, the interaction between healthy aging in diet, I mean uh, food uh, uh, during uh, the old age. I know we know that uh, during the old age, some pathologies are common that are the aging of the immune system, that are oxidative stress, that are nutritional deficiency, and so on. So uh, when we face this problem. We think that there is a, a, a part of medicine that is called geriatry, that is just uh, addressed to this, okay? But from what said uh, Joe, I see that there is also a social geriatry. I mean that there is not only a problem of medicine, of illness, and of health. So how to combine 
this, that is the medical aspect with some uh, illnesses common to our age and the necessity and the need for a society that changes is uh, uh, facing the old age in the sense that there is a, a sort of a social geriatry. So a, a, a medicine, but that is not made of drugs and of response, but is made of the change of life. I, well, this is certainly a very popular um, uh, area um, uh, of uh, both of research and of practice um, uh, in uh, it, certainly in in this country, and I would imagine that in most developed countries. I, I think Joe was touching on that, um, and I, I I will pass um, uh, this question uh, uh, over to Joe because I think um, this is where his combinative um, uh, uh, ideas are, are important. Thank you very much. I think we have to invest into the positive early life conditions on healthy aging. So we must talk about re resilience to crises, resonance during communication, adherence to healthy lifestyles, close contacts with nature, lifelong learning. That's what you were talking about. It's, but, but it's only lifelong learning. It's just one out of 10, 12, 13 different points. For instance, Positive life, sex life experience during adolescence plays an important role because we, we must remember that people at all age are suffering from bad memories. They have nightmares because they have these poorly rationalized experiences from former life and they have lots of buried unconscious feelings. So this is how it, you know, comes together and it must be joint forces in order to help um, people uh, staying healthy until, until the old age. It's a very complex challenge. Thanks, Joe. I think that my time is finished. I don't see any question from others. So thanks again to both of you. I, was, uh, I am very proud to have spoken with you. We, I hope uh, we have been interesting for our friends of the committee and for uh, the audience. And I leave the word uh, to the next one, please. Thank you. So uh, there's a huge push these days uh, around health promotion and disease prevention. Um, but I just wonder if society has grasped uh, the the commitment that needs to be made. And this is really a question back to uh, Joe and uh, Judy. Uh, Judy always used to uh, remind us that uh, the egg from which we formed was uh, uh, developed uh, in our grandmother as our mother went through fetal development. And uh, certainly there were studies that showed uh, that branch the whole uh, field of the developmental origins of disease and that your experience as a fetus could have uh, health outcomes of cardiovascular disease when you were in your 50s and 60s. And if we look at the prevention of osteoporosis as a major contribution to disability after falls and hip fractures, uh, it's the teen years where we have to build up our, our healthy bones. So we're looking at, at definitely what Joe has uh, said and Judy has expounded on for years. Um, how do we get uh, society as a whole and our funders uh, to commit to the resources, the health human resources and societal resources to ensure that uh, babies and children are raised with the uh, best care to have those outcomes in elder healthy aging? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So Anne, are we meant to answer? Um, you're absolutely right. There's a field of medicine, genetics, and society called developmental origins of adult health. And it's quite clear that things that happen to our grandmother can majorly affect us. So if you think about it, the egg that made you was being formed when your mother was an eight-week-old embryo. And there's data from World War II, that the Dutch famine had a huge effect, not only on the children that were in utero, but their children, 
So these are at least three generational effects of trauma, a, a famine, um, other kinds of things that are happening in, in the environment. And I think the First Nations in Northwest America talk about seven generational effects and it may well be possible that these are seven generational um, effects and what we're doing has long-term effects. And of course I'm biased, but I think this area is just fascinating because it has to do with your metabolism, your stress, your psychiatric abnormalities and your microbiome because we're very interactive with all those bugs that live on us. But I think there are very few things we know yet that you can do. And one of them has to do with not overfeeding babies. So grandmothers are always um, accused of wanting to stuff a baby. Um, and it is part of many cultures that a skinny baby is not healthy, so you want to fatten them up. Turns out that's the worst thing you can do because it in actually introduces this child will probably get type two diabetes. So in terms of practical things that we know that are multiple generation, one of the most important things is not to um, fatten up the baby. But there are other kinds of things like stresses. And this actually goes back in evolution a long way. Turns out if a mama fish or a papa fish have been chased by a bigger fish, the babies won't come out of the shadows and their babies won't come out of the shadows and their babies won't come out. So stress is another one of the things that are carried forever. Now, I just wanna say that's not all bad. Some of us actually do well with some stress. So it's actually figuring out what are the differences that make the difference. All right, thank you, Judy. Joe has a comment and then John. Yes, I have a proposal how to teach young, young children. I think, why not inviting school children to university lectures on growth, development, and aging, lectures held by emeriti? This is, I think, is, is a unique chance to bring the young and the old generation together. The important thing is that these lectures must be announced and shown in the media. This is my proposal. Thank you, John. Well, you could, I, 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 I already launched one missive into this conversation by saying the iGen program in Saskatoon is exactly what is required. And the essence of that program is not to cure anything, not to identify a disease and fix it up, not to ameliorate the consequences of earlier uh, negative events. It's to create the positive circumstances of life and yep. demonstrate the importance of the pro-sociality that we can lecture about till we're fatigued and our audience has stopped listening to us, demonstrated by actually creating it. So the way you teach the young and the way you make them happier and healthier uh, is in fact to put them in life circumstances that allow them to help others and allow them to develop the kind of broad social consciousness and connections that will keep them happy, healthy, and contributing throughout their whole lives. And so it's true that because medicine and science, social sciences have been focusing for 50 or 100 years on looking at problems and trying to fix them, they've always been trying to repair damage, and they have only recently got around to thinking holistically and the creation of something better. And once you do that, of course, you uh, one example is um, you now get ministers of loneliness in some national governments. You get people talking about an epidemic of loneliness. I was asked to give a plenary contribution to the public health conference in, in just before COVID in Ottawa. And I said, you've got this all wrong. There should be no ministers of loneliness. If you're going to have ministers related to social issues, it should be a minister of, of social connection. For loneliness, you don't wait until someone is lonely and then deliver medicine to them or something that's... <laughs> Judy, you had a comment. Uh, can I... I, can, I, I 
let me finish that sentence anyway while I've killed off my phone. And the, for loneliness, you don't need a cure, you need a vaccine. Because loneliness is, you don't wait until someone's lonely and then cure it. You create a social environment in which people don't get lonely. Uh, and that's true for so many things that we, we uh, have thought of as problems. You don't wait until they become a problem and then create a whole structure to solve the problem. You ensure that people are given the tools and the capacities to help each other and connect with each other early so that loneliness simply doesn't happen. Yeah. Judy? So, so um, Joe mentioned resiliency and yes. we all need resiliency and we've certainly found that during the COVID. But I wanted to make the point that as a pediatrician, I know that we have seen multiple studies that show if a child has one, one adult in their childhood that they can trust over the years, it makes all the difference. And I think we've learned during COVID that schools, a place that's really important as children are developing because they learn about social interactions and they learn how to make them and how to keep them. Yeah. Can I? Is there a chance to comment on Judith? Yes, certainly. Uh, I like, Julia, I very much like your point. And I would like to ask you, resilience, individual resilience. What's the role of genetics? And what's the role of training res res resilience? This is my question. My statement is that we have in the context of improving healthy aging, we must induce collective resilience. You know, it's not individual resilience only. It's, it's again, we come back to society. It's the environment of the child that has to be supported. Thank you. And John, you had a comment. Yeah, I just want to follow up on what Joe has just said that it, resilience is something that is emblematic of, representative of, and protective of a community, not just an individual. And uh, it, that's what we have discovered in a study of how societies react and succeed and show resilience at a national or community level in response to natural disasters and indeed COVID. And it turns out that the extent to which people connect and trust each other is absolutely fundamental. Uh, and you can imagine why, right? I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll kill this wallet question before we're through, but it's the same kind of help one another that is shown after earthquakes and floods and other disasters that in fact expose the extent to which a society has these kind of watch each other's backs and look after each other. And it turns out to get a chance to help each other, in fact, makes you happier. And of course, the, it's practice resilience, if you like, but it, 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 it becomes more evident to everybody, A, that this kind of social connection and willingness to think about each other is important to, to do it. But the positive thing about these disasters is that people underestimate the extent to which other people are already connected and willing to help. And that's, of course, because the media focus on the bad things and not the good things. And so they don't get a chance to see. And we've proven that because we ask people how likely are their wallets to be returned. And then we've had experiments in 50 countries dropping wallets. And it turns out that uh, people are much more likely to return the wallets than people think they are. And uh, it's really important for your life and everyone else's lives that you realize how supportive the society is in which you live. So John, yes. um, I just uh, would like to ask you uh, uh, with a comment that COVID uh, put a big spotlight on elder care. And we can hope that there could be changes as a, in elder care as a result of this. And in preparation for this, I uh, had a look at some of the webinars you've given over the years, and you have so many anecdotes about the experiences uh, in elder care and what might be done to improve situations. 
And I just wonder if you could give us one or two of those, uh, the, particularly the involvement of elders in design of spaces in which they're going to live in, or the water club. <laughs> That's interesting. You're going back now uh, 15 years when we first started uh, doing uh, these studies. And they were done in elder care facilities in Exeter in the UK. And uh, the, the, the real question was, the water club example was a, a nice one because uh, people who, who, they had water clubs because they, dehydration was an issue for a number of people uh, at higher ages and in elder care. So they formed a water club in which they would get together and drink water. Uh, and uh, it, my colleagues in social psychology said, well, you're doing too many things at once. Let's separate it and separate the club part from the water part. And they did. And of course, all the benefits they were getting from the water club were in fact coming from the club and, uh, and not from the water. The other example was the shift of a, a, a whole group from one uh, uh, building to a new one. And the previously unhappy floor uh, was uh, uh, given to the not just the opportunity, but the obligation of getting, sitting down together and designing in their own social space, no budget or anything for it, just to agree how they were gonna do things. While the previously happy floor uh, had the best of professional design of their spaces, the uh, results were, as you might've guessed, uh, that the previously unhappy floor became the happy floor. And the experts had said those, those self-designed social spaces are never going to be used. In fact, they were used much more than the professionally designed social spaces uh, of, of the other group. And from one to another to another, we find precisely that same kind of uh, reaction. Uh, part of the outflow of that was a meeting with elder care providers in Ontario and uh, where I essentially said, this is all small potatoes. What you should really be doing is combining the old and the young and letting them learn from each other. And I mentioned the iGen project, but a woman beside me nudged me and said, I've got a story for you. And uh, she said, in the summer, we lose a lot of our staff because a lot of them are women with children in the childcare facilities linked to the schools go south when uh, vacations are on. So we decided to solve this problem by uh, setting up a summer camp uh, in the elder care facility. Uh, and I said, how did that work out? I said, you must have had to break a lot of rules to do that. And she said, oh, we had to break a lot of rules to do that. Of course, that's why it is, these things aren't done more because there are all kinds of rules stopping them uh, being done. Uh, but she said, uh, it really worked. And, uh, and I said, what evidence do you have of that? And she said, well, here's pretty good evidence for you. In our facility, like in a lot of these, we have people called wanderers and their people, we lock doors to stop them leaving the facility. And she said, uh, during that whole time, the summer camp was there, uh, the, not one of the wanderers tried to wander. So of course, that is very deep evidence because it's saying these people you thought they'd lost their minds they hadn't lost their minds at all they knew exactly what they wanted they wanted to go home they weren't at home and they wanted to head there and once you made it a home then they felt at home and they uh, wanted to stay thank you judy you had a comment and then well, I, I wanted to come back to joe's suggestion that um children and adults are connected but because we know that children learn from making mistakes. And um, it's part of the evaluation of what went wrong. And I do think that people who've been around for a long time are particularly good at getting the big picture and determining which are the things that actually are the problems. Um, but I, I still think, for instance, COVID, I mean, we know that during this pandemic, there have been amazing help from unknown sources and collaborations and a recognition of big time problems that we might never have gotten around to otherwise. So a making mistake isn't always disastrous, although it could be. Um, I think the issue of um, examining carefully, Joe has this huge philosophical um, perspective, but we all have a pretty big perspective. And the question is, 
how do we learn from the mistakes that we've made? <laughs> good argument. Very good. <laughs> um, so what should, how should I answer this? Learning from mistakes is, is essential. But um, the, the thing is that institutions are reluctant to learn from mistakes because they don't want to admit that they have made mistakes. So the, the part, let's say bureaucracy is, is, um, has shown to be uh, um, a corporate in, in this COVID-19 uh, crisis because it was too slow. It was not open to new ideas. And um, it was certainly overlooking great parts of the holistic whole. That, that, that is, so we can learn, I, I, I agree with you, but, but then we must have to discuss all these items openly and we should not reduce our discussions, let's say, to the problem of retirement homes. We all know that retirement homes retirement homes are no good places for old people. Um, and, uh, but what we discuss is the lack of workforce for these retirement homes. So if we concentrate on these small parts, we lose energy and we, at the end, do not discuss the main problems. Thank you. Um, John, I was, uh, we're talking here about one's quality of life and their happiness and uh, the contribution of this to healthy aging. I was really surprised yesterday to see uh, the first ad that I had seen for a happiness coach. And I gather now that this is big business. And so my question to you is, uh, can you learn to be happy or coach to be happy? A bit more about the circumstances, uh, your networks um, that you live in. Everybody is open to convincing in different ways. And so you want to, to respond to interest from somebody or even lack of interest because people underestimate the importance of the social. They underestimate the importance of the pro-social. So unless they're taught one way or another, and of course, as we're picking up in this older and younger discussion, uh, example is the most uh, impressive teacher. And so if you're in an environment where you see people uh, helping each other and you get a chance to join in, you learn the positive effects of that uh, in, a, in, a, in a very direct way. Uh, the coaching, at an individual level and the a, a, a very large fraction of the airport books you see and the shelves are growing by the uh, uh, year on this uh, are only moderately helpful because they tend to focus on the individual on the individual. This is how to make you happy. And that's not the point. The point that actually ends up and Aristotle got this right first time around, the importance is to make other people happy. And it turns out that ends up making you happy, but you shouldn't be told that because then it will lead you to question the legitimacy of why you're doing it. So that's the importance of the golden rule in every, in every religion. It's you're, you're doing good for others because it's the right thing to do. It's a social norm that in fact is, is reinforcing and feeding back to a better world. But in fact, it, it makes you happier too the biggest way of teaching happiness we're finding now uh, to a surprising extent uh, since the World Happiness Report started 10 years ago is that you'll see in all these uh, happiness articles, a very big, large number of them, they're now turning their emphasis from the material to the social. And they're doing that by changing the winners, i.e. the people we ought to be emulating from the richer countries uh, to the Nordic countries. 
And there's all been all these books about what is special about the Nordic countries. And of course, what you find out what is typically special about those countries is that they are exemplars of where people look out for each other. And so the people who are writing books on, on that line, uh, they are implicitly and sometimes explicitly also what, how can you change your own life in order to implement this broader vision? Uh, and the, the, those are the most valuable of the uh, books on how to be happy. Thank you. I noticed Luigi had his hand up and uh, the time for uh, my asking questions of our panelists is finished. Uh, and I'll ask uh, Luigi uh, uh, to uh, uh, make his comments. Um, we're keeping an eye on the questions in the uh, question box. And by continuing this conversation, I think between Luigi and I, we may be able to address uh, many of the questions that are coming up. But Luigi? Yes. We have 10, 10 questions, I see. Uh, just a, a comment to uh, many of you said about the necessity, the need to learn. But uh, in order to learn, we need somebody who is able to, to teach. And now between uh, teaching and learning, there is a gap because uh, we need uh, for learning uh, an holistic approach. As uh, Joe said, uh, many several times to this, this evening. But our teaching is articulated traditionally according to disciplinary vision. That means that is deterministic more teaching than holistic. So we have a teaching that follows a way and a learning that needs another way. So this gap is, uh, is confusing. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, a... Anne, uh, we, I, we, we have to, to pass to the questions from the audience. So we have uh, 10 questions. Please, it begins you. Well, uh, that's been very quiet in this discussion, and it's probably just as good because we've had lots of chatting. Uh, but perhaps this question might be best, uh, first of all, directed to uh, Les. Um, around uh, somebody suggesting that there be a follow-up session uh, asking artists uh, across the art form to contribute their thoughts on healthy aging and humanities practitioners in general. Um, and a project suggested that this person is involved with has a working title of the talking cure meets the writing cure. So uh, to me, this uh, took one out of their uh, potential comfort zone of their career into new opportunities uh, to learn. <laughs> um, yes, the, um, uh, if we can interpret um, uh, what we, we mean by an artist in this, um, and uh, um, uh, are we distinguishing between a, a creative um, artist? Are we looking at um, uh, and it's something we haven't talked about much uh, at the moment about uh, uh, about creativity? Um, and, and of course, uh, uh, many people. Um, uh, uh, turn to uh, uh, creative arts um, as, as part of their um, uh, retirement uh, experience and benefit um, uh, from it. Um, uh, perhaps most famously, uh, Winston Churchill um, in, in, in this country. Um, uh, but uh, equally too, um, uh, uh, for, um, for many people who have had a career um, in, in, in science, um, then um, uh, uh, having a, 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 a uh, a, a new um, opportunity to study the arts and, and humanities um, uh, can be um, a broadening of the uh, horizons. Um, uh, I spoke earlier about um, the narrowing that, um, uh, that, that we all experience in our professional lives. Um, uh, and uh, perhaps one of the greatest narrowing uh, that, uh, that we suffer from uh, is uh, that division between uh, uh, the liberal arts uh, and and the sciences um, that um, that uh, um, is is actually quite a, a matter of debate um, uh, at, uh, 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 at the moment. Uh, uh, interesting question as to whether the um, uh, 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 which is older, the, the sciences or, or, or the arts, um, uh, uh, maybe uh, that um, uh, that. that um, 
a, a, a division of, um, of, of learning occurred um, and, and the two branches emerged at the same time. Um, uh, and uh, I think that's um, uh, probably uh, just a, a reflection of the body of knowledge and our uh, capacity to, um, uh, uh, to, to deal with that. Uh, but I thought it was a very interesting suggestion. The second, the second question comes from Sonia uh, Gunev, and maybe Joe, you can uh, you can answer because he's speaking about happiness. Why yeah. one doesn't want to take away from the Bhutanese happiness? Uh, no, yeah, it might it, it it might not be quite an, as obvious to the Nepalese community that have been attempting to live in Bhutan to, for a quite long time? I, I can't answer that question. I think you addressed it to me, uh, that the contribution that Bhutan has made to a holistic view of, of human success was to say, it was the term gross national happiness rather than gross uh, national product that they were twisting and it's the picking up of that uh, mantle uh, and it's sharing around the world uh, has focused attention on what does make for uh, happier lives. It is not that Bhutan itself has ever been in the ranks of the happiest countries, it has not. And uh, it's got many things where it has taught us and it's, it's handling of COVID, for example, has been quite extraordinary. The extent to which they had these social norms that were protecting people and they had a scientific community coming together very quickly and a great sense of common purpose. And they, I think they had to wait a long time despite their many tourists going in and out in the earlier phases, um, uh, they, they were a world leader. Uh, in, in that as in many other things. Um, the fact that they have uh, uh, subnational communities, which I've seen at some conferences, uh, who are, are not part of the mainstream and are tr having trouble fitting in. This idea of how diversity is handled within populations is something that we have given a lot of study to and a lot of other people to. Nobody's going to suggest that once you take well-being as your objective that you automatically have it, but it allows you to reframe what it is that A, is wrong with what's happening and what could be done, what could be built and gives you some tools as to how to start doing it. So they're in a better place for dealing with those kind of issues you mentioned of migrant communities than most countries are, and they're trying. Um, please. Oh, um, a comment or uh, question uh, to Judy about uh, uh, making the point uh, of how useful it is to have models to guide right, retired faculty in choosing activities and whether or not you've got any awareness of research that links well-being with the types of activities retired faculty engage in. So I'm not aware of research but I have made a big point of collecting examples. Um, and these have been published uh, um, in an article that I wrote, but also in a report that our emeritus group made together with the faculty association um, about uh, things not to do after you've retired and opportunities to be useful, both to your organization, your university, um, and then as well to uh, communities at large. Vancouver has an organization called Volunteer Vancouver, which tries to hook people up with an area that they're are of their interest together with um, the person. Um, and there are many such organizations um, actually around the world. But, but I think seeing a list of the things that you might take on it's really useful because you don't necessarily take them right away, but you may take them later. And I just wanted to add to the whole business of the liberal arts. Um, many of us who've been missing them in our lives um, uh, take something up in and around the time we're retiring. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. The biggest thing among Ameriti that I'm interested in now is what happens over time. 
So you retire, you're really busy for 10 years, um, and then what? Um, the one thing that when I've done interviews, every um, emerita test person, uh, maritime, anyhow, um, every one of them says is, I get the big picture. Can't stay, stay end up with, keep up with the details, but I have a new vision of how things interrelate. And I'm kind of convinced that our brains somehow start doing more of that big picture and more philosophically how things fit in. So the right answer, Nancy, is there, there are several long lists and I'm happy to send you one, but it's for people as they're starting to think about retiring, they need to look at all those possibilities. Um, and that's partly why I like that third group who take their talents and experience and use it in a new way. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, now we, I think is we can uh, uh, couple to the question because they treat the same argument that is happiness. So ask Joe to, to answer and the questions are, how spirituality, spirituality is uh, related to happiness? That's the first and the second about happiness, how happiness influences genetics. Do you want me to answer? Yeah. Luigi? No, first yeah, of all, I would, I, would, I, would I would like to include John in because he's speaking about happiness. My question to John is, satisfaction is the balance between expectations and fulfilled needs and desires. So where do you rank satisfaction in under this umbrella or uh, term happiness? The next thing is fulfilled life is based on the exhausted own potentials and achieved goals. I must say, I would be happy to be satisfied at the age of 85 and to have a fulfilled life. I am not asking for happiness. Uh, John, how do you, you know, these are yes, terms sir. have to be used. Yes, I, 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 I asked uh, Joe for this mutuality, but now I pass to John for the uh, relating uh, to genetics. Well, well I'd, I'd like to answer the first question first. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, the, there are a lot of ongoing projects on the second question, and I don't have any very solid results to offer you uh, yet, but we have, we have hopes uh, there will be a, uh, a, a link, a, ch a special chapter in the next World Happiness Report, our, our 10th edition, on the link between biology and happiness. And that includes not only the genetic aspects, but the epigenetic aspects and, and the gut. Um, and so we'll get a more definitive uh, expert-driven review at that time. So patience. Uh, on uh, uh, Joe's question about, I don't need happiness if I have satisfaction and this sense of, of, of that balance. And I said, well, in fact, that is what produces happiness. So we want to make a distinction and many linguistic philosophers have made this distinction uh, between happiness, the emotion and happiness as a judgment about something. And okay. we, study, we study both in the World Happiness Report. So we follow emotional reports about various positive and negative emotions yesterday. But the world ranking of happiness and the one that ought to be the focus for policy attention is something very akin to what you're talking about. It's asking people to think about their lives as a whole and how satisfied are you with your life? I mean, there's one question that says, think is the best possible life is a 10 and the worst is a zero. There's another that says, how satisfied are you with your life as a whole? Another is how happy are you with your life as a whole? It turns out those questions are functionally almost identical it's because we've some surveys that have asked both questions in the same survey of the same people. And it turns out that these so-called life evaluations are getting at exactly what you're talking about. And uh, it, the, the uh, affective component is not absent. Aristotle did say, you know, you're not gonna have somebody with a really satisfactory life unless they've had their share of happy moments. And that's exactly true too. 
Um, but it's much more than that. And it's much more evaluative in just the sense that your question presupposed. Yes, John, but uh, the question is uh, why in uh, the same situation, some people are commonly happy and other not? Well, that's where genetics come in and let's pass that over to Judy. Well, I wanna say epigenetics because that's the whole study yeah. of multiple generations and the fact that you actually do inherit certain kinds of things, not because you've got a change in your gene, but because something has turned them off, turned off a pathway. We don't understand it fully, but there is no question that things that have happened in your mother and father's life, your grandmother and grandfather's life do have effects on how you perceive the world and how you develop as a child. And, 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 and some, of, some of our uh, 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 genetics colleagues on this project are emphasizing that the more you recognize the specifics of the genetic backgrounds and the epigenetic experiences, the more easy it is to think of remedies if it's something wrong or opportunities for something good that are more person specific. In other words, going back to an earlier question, how can people become more happy? Turns out the answers to that will become more nuanced and more specific to who is being looked at in what circumstances. So it's both the light, their own life circumstances, their social context and their own individual uh, toolkit, if you like. So I think it's yours. Sorry, Luigi. Yours, uh, Anna, you, you, can, you can go on. So I think this will be uh, the last question. Uh, and again, uh, to John, um, that of the uh, fundamental life characteristics, uh, you found uh, trust is a must and the importance of trust. Uh, COVID has uh, just exploded uh, the social media and uh, false news and the views of other people uh, around uh, just the nature of the epidemic, if it exists at all, and vaccines. What can we do to counter that or uh, counter the erosion of trust? Uh, there's a long history of experimental work, a lot of it in the psychology and a lot in political science about asking uh, what builds an environment in which people can collectively decide on something that's good for everybody and not just seems good for themselves. A lot of it has to do with handling of joint water projects and so on. It turns out the magic glue is in fact social, personal social connections to actually uh, talk to someone is way better than seeing only them in writing or in the abstract to meet them face to face, whether zooming like this or better uh, is absolutely critical importance to mix people with different backgrounds from diverse uh, sources is also extraordinarily important. In other words, joint collective and individual social connection is critically important. So that's why you have to get out of the blame game. You have to get out of the me versus the others. And in social psychology, it's, it's thought of as building superordinate identities because traditional sociology, traditional social psychology is all about us, them distinctions. He said, that's all wrong. Once you start thinking about us, them distinctions, then you create your own unity by us versus them. And that's neither helpful nor necessary. And especially in COVID type examples that you're thinking about, you have to create uh, through a variety of specific ways in which it can be done, a sense of the bigger us, because you're not gonna handle global warming without that. You're not gonna avoid or minimize the consequences of future pandemics without that. You have to create, and of course, trust goes along with this, social identity, implies a, a coterminous uh, delivery of trust. So there are examples in organizations, examples in families, examples in, in global politics, but there, there are some known mechanisms, but social connections, uh, positive ones are the magic sauce. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
I think it is now time for Luigi and I to, uh, yeah. to close the question period and turn things back to uh, Diane Noel. Thanks also for me, to all the speakers, to Anna for his precious uh, help and, and uh, cooperation. And we pass it to the last uh, uh, part of our uh, meeting. Please, uh, Diane. Well, this is uh, quite a session. And I want to uh, thank very much a number of people who have been contributing to this. Um, starting with the panelists, Judith Hall, John Hillerwell, Les Ebdon, and Joe Eric, and the moderators, Luigi Campanella and Ann Junker. Um, thanks to UBC President Santa Ono, who really, I think everyone at the college would agree without him, there wouldn't be an emeritus college. And uh, he has been a, a very true supporter and enthusiast. And he tweeted a long, um, the other day, a very long announcement about this this uh, this meeting. So uh, it gives you some idea of what he thinks of Emeriti and of the Emeritus College. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, the president of the European Association of Professors Emeriti, uh, Natali Gaspare de Santo, whose idea was not only to have this event but to have the Emeritus College host it. And uh, I know that, that the uh, European Association, it takes very seriously uh, the, the uh, celebration on October the 1st. And this year, I believe this is one of four events that they, are, uh, that they have produced. So that's a very big commitment. Um, I would like to thank uh, the, also the, of course, our principal of our college, Joost uh, Bloom. Um, I want to thank fellow members of the of the uh, uh, program committee. That would be uh, Sir Les Ebdon, Ebdon and Donald Fisher, who is a past president of the Emeritus College, and and uh, Luigi uh, Campanella. I'd like to thank also our Emeritus College manager, who's who uh, with assistance from. UBC um, uh, Technical Services has done all of the background to the script and the, yes, uh, thanks indeed, uh, and, and to pull all this together technically for us and support us. And thank also Michelle Penns of the Office of the Vice President Provost International, who has been such a supporter of this particular event, and Terry Lavender of the Office of the President of UBC. And I also want to thank all the participants. So many of you uh, having to come in in different time zones and keep track of, of the uh, links and registration and so on. Uh, it is very much appreciated. And I took seriously Joe's suggestion that we might think of the opposite of old as being the new rather than young and to sort of embrace that. And uh, I think everyone would agree that there has been very stimulating discussions and ideas today that will help us uh, on that path. And that in fact, everyone has addressed this issue of the new. And if we had a different panel, I think the same thing would happen, but in different ways. So it's, a, it's an achievement for emeritus uh, professors and also for our, our respective associations. And I thank you all very, very much. Thank you. And thanks to you, Diane. Oh, oh. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Let's hope we can do this, something like this again next year. Bye-bye. <laughs>